Um, I apologize to uh, our witnesses. Um, the uh, uh, roll call took an additional 15 minutes that had not been anticipated. Um, let me uh, let me uh, uh, ask uh, Ms. Floyd, um, in terms of uh, wind potential, um, there are stories that there could be upwards of 4,000 new megawatts added this year to the national grid. Do you agree with that number? Well, I just want to remind the chairman that I am, I was a wind developer in the early 80s, and I now invest um, in a very broad range of technologies. So I probably don't have those statistics at hand. I did mention in my testimony that um, in the state of Washington last year they added 1,000 megawatts. So certainly I think that is in the ballpark. And what is, what, what is Texas going to add this year? Uh, just this year's 2,000 megawatts, about $3 billion worth of wind farms. So Washington State was 1,000, Texas is 2,000. Um, there were only 11,000 megawatts of natural gas added last year to the whole national grid, only 600 megawatts of um, coal, no nuclear and no uh, oil. So what do you think is reasonable then, Mr. Sloan? What, what could we expect from Texas? Um, uh, this year, did you say 2,000 megawatts? Uh, approximately 2,000 megawatts this year. Uh, similar numbers are, are certainly av available going into the future. A key limitation is going to be infrastructure. There is more investor interest. There's literally 40,000 megawatts of wind projects that are evaluating interconnecting to the system. Right now? Right now. So. There could be upwards of 5,000 megawatts a year being added in 2012 if the interconnection transmission issues are resolved. If, if the country uh, were to get very serious about co accommodating those resources that the market wants to add, uh, it could be very high numbers. Yeah, well, you know, the interesting thing about that is that the nuclear industry, after 50 years, has 100,000 megawatts. And uh, they haven't added any new megawatts in a generation. So here along, uh, here comes wind adding upwards of 4,000 this year, and, and uh, that's nationally. Uh, but that seems like a conservative estimate given what we're hearing about Washington State and Texas, that the nation might average uh, eight or 10,000 megawatts a year being added. Uh, in another five years, uh, and uh, at that pace, within 10 years, it would match the nuclear industry. Now, it doesn't have the same um, ability to produce it on a regular basis, but that's quite a story. Yeah, if, if I can, there's the capability, I think, of the industry to gear up to do that, but the two key challenges will be infrastructure, and you have to proactively look ahead. You will need the transmission lines to get from those windy areas to markets where people can use it. And also is the supply chain, if you, if you will, you know, manufacturing the wind turbines and components, which has been pointed out, is not done very much today in the United States. But if, if the country were to get very serious with an RES, you would see, I think, an enormous investment in manufacturing of those components. Right. Oh, could, yes. Mr. And could I just add an issue, uh, a, a, a point on infrastructure? One of the areas that we're investing in is "quote unquote" smart grid, and um, you know whether we like it or not, this country is going to have to invest in the infrastructure. For the last two decades, uh, the amount of investment in the grid. Has, uh, has declined dramatically. And so just from a reliability standpoint, never mind being able to handle this additional wind generation and other distributed generation, there is going to have to be an investment and an upgrade in that, in that infrastructure to provide the kind of reliability that, uh, that customers demand. Mm -hmm. Now, um, wind, as a result, has a chance to really make a big difference in terms of what our national needs will be for new electrical generation between now and the year 2030. I mean, if you project just, let's just say it's 5,000 a year 
for 23 years, you're over, you have, you have 115,000 megawatts by 2030. And nuclear only has 100,000 today. But if you make it 10,000 per year, it really picks up nationally now. Uh, Texas at 2,000 is at the dawn of the era, you're saying almost, huh? So Texas might start adding even more huh, per year. And so you do have this uh, real likelihood that there could be upwards of 200,000 megawatts of wind in the United States by the year 2030. Uh, is that realistic? Is that, um, is that possible if we make the right transmission uh, decisions? Or is there a limitation on how much wind we can produce? Well, I will say there, there certainly is a limitation, but we will not reach it for a long time. If you look at the potential of wind, it is virtually unlimited. Uh, just in the state of Texas, we literally have sufficient sites to support 500,000 megawatts of wind. And the, the good ones, there was recently a major study, in fact, we're in the middle of it in Texas right now, called Competitive Renewable Energy Zones, and they identified 150,000 megawatts of quality sites. Uh, they're available, but it's going to be limited in your ability to use it, use it locally, but also export it to other areas where they can use it. Texas has always embraced the idea that it is an energy producer. Uh, there's other states that take that on. Uh, you mentioned the NIMBY issues and banana issues. Uh, in, in Texas and other producing regions, they can build large-scale projects. So. I understand that. But, I mean, it, Texas hasn't always embraced it. I mean, TXU was going to build 11 coal-fired plants. Um, and so that's, that's clearly a, what we call it a lagging uh, <laughs> indicator of where um, the future is going. And now, you know, with the new owners, they're moving in a different direction. I don't know if they're embracing renewables. They're saying they can get by with only three coal-fired plants. But uh, to the extent to which um, uh, Texas is now becoming the leader uh, and showing the way. Um, I'd just like you to elaborate, then I'll allow the other witnesses to answer it. Um, I, I read a story in the Washington Post uh, back, back in March. It was a story about West Texas and a family in West Texas that was now allowing these turbines to be placed on their farmland. And uh, while well, they kind of missed the farmland and they were taking photographs of what it looked like at, with, at, with one wind turbine per acre, they were already up to 23 uh, wind turbines. Um, and uh, and the, the story said that some farmers get paid upwards of $10,000 a, a turbine. That might be on the high side. But even at, let's say, 5,000, 3,500, you put up 100 of those turbines on your farm and you can plug it into the grid, um, uh, you've got a pretty stable uh, source of income for your children, for your grandchildren, uh, out into eternity, really, uh, in terms of uh, uh, providing uh, electricity. So is that really what's happening? Is this catching on like a fever out in West Texas with farmers and ranchers saying, put those wind turbines on my land? Absolutely. It is a boom, just like the oil boom in the 30s and 50s in Texas. Uh, there's essentially a frenzy going on to get in the wind business. There's this limitation of the, uh, the, the infrastructure, but that is being dealt with by the state of Texas through this process. Um, and well, tell me about what, what what effect did the renewable electricity standard that Governor Bush put on the books back in 97 or so have on this wind explosion? Is there a relationship between the renewable electricity standard that he signed into law and this phenomenon? Absolutely. If you think about it, there's other places in the country that are as windy as Texas. We've got good wind sites, but other places, South Dakota is an example, maybe even has better wind sites. Everyone had availability to the production tax credit, the federal incentives, yet Texas really took off, and it was because of the quality of the state incentives. Uh, it was laid out in a pretty simple fashion, uh, the, the RES in Texas, and importantly, all of the stakeholders got involved. Originally, there was hesitance from a lot of the utilities. They were very skeptical, but when you had public polls where the utilities customers were saying, listen, we really want more renewable energy, everyone got on board. The political leaders, the electric utilities, and other stakeholders, the industry and consumer environmental groups. 
and it really was a recipe to make it all move forward. So that, that's the important thing about a, an RES. It is a catalyst to get action going. Um, Mr. Hobson. Um, this is exciting. It's exciting stuff. Um, it, it, it's great that it's great that we're able to take advantage of uh, wind resources in the country where they exist. But I think it's important to keep this in context. We we operate in this country, uh, and we demand as consumers of electricity an electricity system that operates at 90 plus percent reliability. The best wind turbine in the very best wind site has an availability probably no more than 40 percent of the time. And so when we reach a point in this country where, where wind turbines are, 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 are called on to do more than just supplying energy when they can, which is what's going on today, when we, when we get to the point where we want to rely on wind turbines a, as a part of the backbone of the system, we will have to put in place traditional generation technologies that will be able to operate during those times when wind is not available. So for instance, if I have a load forecaster who tells me next year you're gonna have, we're going to need 1,000 additional megawatts in Georgia, and we decide that we're going to do that with wind, I will have to build right beside it another 1,000 megawatts of, say, gas-fired combustion turbines or combined cycle units because I can't count that wind as capacity. It, it won't be available when I need it. And so I have to make sure that my 90% reliability threshold is met. And you can't do that with, with wind. How so, is Texas handling that issue, uh, Mr. Sloan? Uh, these are, are issues that have come up. We hear these all the time. Uh, and I will just point to Europe. Europe already uses very high penetrations of wind. Some countries, for instance, Denmark, in a single month earlier this year, the average energy was 35 percent coming from wind power. So it can be done. I mean, there's physical examples of how it can be done. And I would, I would actually argue that wind power makes the electric system more reliable. And the reason is because utility planners do not count on it to be there for capacity. It is an energy resource. So it's there sometimes when you're not expecting it, it will be there. And an analogy would be, in this room, you have lights. You have enough lights to make sure that you can light this room. But if these lights go out, you could probably open those shades uh, behind and, and take advantage of natural light. The, the natural wind resource and solar resource, the fuel is free. And you should, it's, it's almost a sort of common sense approach. Take what nature gives you and use your controllable resources when you need to to fill in the gaps. Doesn't wind have a higher capacity factor than natural gas? Yes. It does. On average in this country. One thing I, I, I want to see if I can clarify. And isn't natural gas increasingly going to become a problem because we are going to be importing it as liquefied natural gas from um, more and more unstable parts of the rest of the world? And so that is also a factor. You have that instability as well. Uh, and uh, it does raise issues there. Mr. Hobson. M Mr. Chairman, as much as we would like for it to be a, a, any 40 percent capacity factor source of generation cannot become the backbone of a 90 percent plus reliable electricity system. Yeah. Can it become 15 percent of it? Well, it can't even really become 15 percent of it. He said it correctly. You're saying the governor of Colorado is heading for trouble? No, 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 no. Having no, a 20 no, percent no. Uh, standard? No, no, no. I, I understand what I'm saying. He said it correctly. If, if, I have wind, if I have wind resources, if I have enough capacity on the ground to meet my load through traditional means, and I have wind resources that are available to me, Sure, it makes a lot of sense to take advantage of that free fuel when I can and not run a, another source of energy. That makes sense. But I have to build the capacity to make sure I can supply my customers when they call on the demand. So, 
So my customers, in essence, will be paying twice as much for generation because if I put a wind turbine on the ground, I've got to put a gas turbine on the ground as well. But as long as we are developing wind resources as we are now for, for, for those areas where reliability is not the issue, I, I think that's terrific. I think that it becomes problematic when we think we're going to be building 40% capacity factor resources to supply electricity for our customers. In a 90% system, it's just not going to happen. Now, technology may get better, but where we are right now, I can't rely on a 40% capacity factor wind turbine to supply my customers. And how does Denmark that. do it, Mr. Hobson? I'm sorry? How does Denmark do it? I'm, I'm not familiar with Denmark. I would, I, I would Could you do me a favor? Could you, could you look at Denmark and then in writing um, send back to us your answer as to why um, we could not adopt a system like Denmark uh, in order to ensure that wind is incorporated, not at a 35 percent or 25 percent, but at a 15 percent level? If you could give us that analysis, uh, have your experts look at Denmark and tell us uh, what is different in their system uh, from ours. But we'd be happy to do that. Okay, that would but help my, us. My suspicion would be one of two things, Mr. Chairman. My suspicion would be that Denmark, if you look, if you look at Denmark, they have a backbone electrical system that can manage their needs uh, and, and use the wind resources when they're available. Right. Uh, or interconnections with other countries. Right. They have some source of power. But we could do that, too. I mean, there's no reason. I mean, the Southern sure. Company, obviously, unconstrained by PUCA, is across more and more states. And, and so, obviously, you uh, were advertising changes in laws as a way for you to interconnect and have more efficiency across state lines, right? Sure. Sure. And, of course, the more states that are included in any grid is the more likely it's the wind is blowing in some other state that's right. you know, another 500 miles away, and that's all then going to be part of this interconnected grid. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be windy in all parts of a grid no, in order to get uh, a 30 or 40 percent. Uh, it just has to be uh, windy in parts of the grid in order to kind of maintain that level of stability. And then I think statistically you would probably wind up in a situation where it is highly unlikely to not be windy everywhere <laughs> at the same time, you know, and that probably doesn't happen very often anywhere uh, as long as the grid is interconnected and it is large enough. So I guess what I am saying is where there is a will, there is a way. Uh, well, and, um, and it just depends upon the Oh, again, and analyzing Denmark would be great okay. because it seems to me that's what you're saying. That there's an interconnection; they can get it from other places, and if that's possible, that would help us. Ms. Floyd. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I just want to put my venture capital hat on and to say that you know, 2.4 billion dollars of capital didn't go into the status quo, and so to be assured that there is money and investment going into new energy storage technologies that could be at a very large scale. Uh, that there is investment going into when you talk about overall wind potential. And again, there are many technologies. We have talked a lot about wind and solar today, but um, uh, looking at wind turbines that are very efficient in moderate wind regimes, not just the very highest wind regimes. So I just want, uh, again, to remind the committee that there is new technology being developed that uh, when we invest, we expect there will be commercial product within a year or two of that investment and a lot of money going into energy storage. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Foster, you had your hand up. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. I was going to observe that um, my state of Minnesota uh, has the distinction of being the largest uh, importer of electrical energy of any state in the country. And so we've looked at the development of the wind resources uh, in Minnesota really as an opportunity for promoting a level of homegrown energy production and energy independence, one of the themes of this committee. Uh, but the largest source of Minnesota's power has been from the Canadian Manitoba hydro system. And in my experience in talking about these issues in Minnesota, the hydro systems provide themselves really as natural energy storage uh, locations for uh, wind reserves so that when wind resources are being utilized, hydro systems can be, in a sense, turned off and the energy stored that would otherwise have passed through the hydro systems. And so it seems to me that you have got built in 
to an awful lot of the, the uh, energy systems in the United States already, a homegrown storage facility for the uh, uh, complementary use of, of uh, hydro with wind generation. I mean, like Minnesota, New England imports electricity from another country as well, Canada, same as you. So we import. And what would be the receptivity, for example, of Minnesota to importing electricity from South Dakota if they were able to exploit their wind resources there and the transmission issues were overcome? Would that be something that was consistent with the history of importing electricity from Canada? It certainly would in our state. And I obviously understand in this debate the sensitivities that uh, states have about importing energy from other states, but that certainly has been our history of uh, producing electricity where it's cheap and where fuel sources were cheap and then importing it. The thing that I have found uh, most exciting in terms of economic development is the degree to which the growth of renewable energy really touches every state in the country and every state has the potential for producing uh, its 15 percent renewables uh, on its own, which is something that didn't currently exist under our current system of electrical production, uh, my home state of Minnesota being a prime example, because until the development of efficient wind resources, we never had the capacity to generate much of our own uh, right. electrical fuel. Right. I mean, New England is not too far different there. Yeah. So I guess some states get used to importing oil and or any energy resource, and other states get used to exporting it and don't like the idea of importing anything from anyone. But I think that's more a personality uh, factor than it is uh, something that can't be dealt with as a market issue. The Southern Company seems to want to avoid importing any electricity into its region, but uh, the other regions get used to it <clears throat> just out of necessity. Um, and I think that's a factor as well. And, and there are always the agreements that can be worked out. We, in grammar school, at least in Boston, we have a chapter in every one of our geography books entitled Our Friends, the Canadians. <laughs> so we just learn how dependent we are going to be upon the Canadians for so many things from the early age. And we don't even give it a second thought that there's Quebec Hydro and all this natural gas coming down into our region. We kind of ex accept it as a part of our um, energy profile, huh? at least my 31 years on the committee. Uh, Mr. Reedy, can we go to the solar issue in, um, in Florida? Um, Mr. Hobson is talking about the clouds in uh, Florida and how it's not as good as uh, Arizona or New Mexico. Uh, is that true? No. No, sir. Um, the, we do have less solar resource in Florida. It's a different kind of solar resource. It's diffuse, uh, has a, a large component of diffuse energy as compared to direct sunlight, direct focused energy. But pa photovoltaic panels uh, respond very well to diffuse energy. Uh, are there we, success stories in Florida right now? Uh, there certainly are. Um, we, we do have uh, our resource when compared to the very best in, in, the, in the world uh, is about 85 percent of, of the resource, uh, say, in Arizona. And Georgia is something around 83 percent. I, I don't call that limited and I don't call that uh, um, inferior. Uh, it's, and that, that 83 percent is twice the resource in Germany, as we've discussed earlier today. So, how, so Germany is successful in deploying solar at 40 to 45 percent? Of the world's best, yes, sir. Yeah. Correct. Um, and it, it, would Arizona and New Mexico be at 100 percent and Florida and Georgia be at uh, 85, 85 three percent, something of that yeah. nature? Uh, so the, the, the success comes from the distributed nature of the So generation. they would be, in other words, they would be in the upper quintile, Florida for wind potential, I mean Absolutely. Uh, solar potential. It is the sunshine state. I, I, you know, it's, again, it's hard. I owe us. that to Governor Christ. <laughs> See, we, we, in, in 1940, there were 16 congressmen from Massachusetts and six from Florida, 1940. We now have 10, and they have 30. And my, my grandfather was one of those immigrants. Just, I, I think they left for 
the weather. <laughs> yes, sir. Sun. It might, it might not have been the sun, but that's what they all said when they were saying goodbye, uh, that they were just tired of the winters, the clouds, the snow, the rain, and they were going down to the sunshine state. So, um, so it does seem to me that they would be in the upper quintile of a sun available, and then the technology deployed to capture it would, it seemed to me, have to be developed. It might be somewhat dissimilar from Arizona or from Germany, but uh, clearly that's not a question, that's more a question of will than technology. Absolutely. You do agree with that? I agree with that, and I, I, I think that the having the certainty is, is the real measure yeah. of success. We know where we're going. And could, again, Mr. Hobson, can you, can you do, do you dispute that Florida is in the upper quintile of the country in terms of availability of sunshine? You know, Mr. Chairman, like I, I said earlier, I, 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 I want to try to draw the distinction between solar, several things I'd like to say about solar. One is I like to draw the distinction between the demand side use of solar versus the, general, the supply side use of solar. I think solar has great promise. Even in the southeast, we see, we see examples of it all the time, of, of uh, individual applications of solar for, for uh, end use. For instance, we, we sponsored with Georgia Tech um, during the Olympics. Their swimming natatorium uh, is all solar panels. Southern Company helped Georgia Tech. We funded that. It's still operating today. It's a great application. There are those kinds of applications. It just becomes a different value proposition when you're thinking about using something like solar on a large scale for the production of electricity on the supply side. It's not. Just, it's still things like reliability. That's no, I understand that. No, I understand these reliability questions. Which uh, can I ask the, the Southern Company as well then to? provide for us your analysis of the comparison between the, uh, the Southern Company and Germany in terms of their integration of solar into their grid and uh, why you couldn't do that, what the <laughs> obstacles would be for you to match Germany at a 40 percent uh, uh, solar level with, uh, with uh, uh, it seems to me, a higher level of predictability and, uh, and guaranteed uh, source. And, you know, the, the, I'm sorry, yes, sir. One other point I would say about solar that, that has to be made, and that is that we operate in a region where our customers are paying about eight cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. Um, we, we view solar in the 50 cent per kilowatt hour range. And so aside from just the technical challenges associated with solar, there are economic challenges associated. Well, can I go back to you again, Mr. Reedy? In, in Florida, is it 50 cents a kilowatt hour? Uh, no, sir, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, even in a one-off small applications, it's well well below 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh -huh. In utility scale applications, uh, there's, there's analysis that supports something uh, around 11 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour in large, very large utility applications. Where, could, you give, could you give Mr. Hobson an example where, of where it's under 30 cents a kilowatt hour already? Um, you might not be able, aware of in Florida. Well, throughout the markets in California and New Jersey, which is uh, pretty far north again, fair amount of clouds, uh, those are the costs that are, that are, that are being seen by installers and contractors and, and by the end user. Uh, so it's, it, we would take great issue with those figures. Um, and the technology is vastly improving and by prediction of an analysis of the Department of Energy, it's, it, it's going to be down around, um, you know, 15 cents in about five years. Is, Gov is Governor Chris um, pessimistic about solar energy in Florida? Is he aware of how cloudy it is down there? Governor Christ has a say, and he says it can be done. It can be done. And uh, he is very optimistic about it. Yeah, I do think it gets cloudy down there in Florida. It, it, it's, you're on the beach all day. It's unbelievably hot. You've got 35 you know, skin protection on to protect you against the sun. And then around 4.30 every afternoon, you have a thunderstorm that cools off the state. It really happens every day. And then it's like an hour, and then it gets nice again. And so that's a misimpression, those of us who pay a lot of money to go to Florida uh, to get warm during the day have. But the clouds, it just seems to us, just don't last that long, or at least the ads.
kind of just have the clouds going by very, very briefly, and the rest of the day it's quite beautiful. So uh, I, I just think that we need to work a little bit more here with the Southern Company, and learning a little bit more about Germany and Denmark and um, other states that have already reached a lower point price, uh, a price point for their, their solar. Here's what, let's do this. Let's, let's ask each of you to give us the one minute that you want us to remember as we're going forward uh, about these issues. And, uh, and we'll go in reverse order. Uh, and uh, we will uh, begin with you, Mr. Foster. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would uh, like to stress to the committee, uh, as somebody with a lifetime of activity being concerned about uh, working people and their jobs, uh, that we're losing the global economic con uh, competition in this country because of our tolerance of energy inefficiency and our reliance on dirty forms of energy. Uh, we're seeing uh, the alternative in uh, countries like Germany, Denmark, Japan. Germany uses half the amount of energy per capita as we do. Um, we have a way forward that would do uh, an enormous amount to restore manufacturing capacity in those parts of our country that have been hard hit over the last uh, decade, losing some three million manufacturing jobs. We can do it based on a strategy of embracing global warming solutions, which include, as I said, uh, very specific uh, targeted mandates from federal government, like a renewable energy standard, uh, by believing in the efficacy over the long term of meeting the global warming challenge by capping our global warming emissions and relying on the creativity and innovation and hard work of the American people. Thank you. And how many jobs, again, how many jobs do you think are at stake here? Uh, we believe that we would be on balance 1.4 million jobs better had we taken on seriously the Kyoto Protocol targets 10 years ago. Well, thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Reedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would, would close with an emphasis that solar energy is extremely predictable, uh, extremely reliable, and is becoming extremely economic. Uh, and I, I look forward to the day that we would be not discussing its cost as greater than conventional generation, and that day will not be so far off, I would add, but rather less than conventional generation. And it would uh, it serve the utility well as a peaking unit, uh, it, which is a, a common practice today, and is, is today economic with peaking generation. So I would urge that with a lead in photovoltaics followed by solar thermal energy, we will find, uh, find this discussion uh, delightfully mute in, in the near future. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hobson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what I'd say is I, I would like for us to look to the success that the state of Colorado has had uh, and, and hopefully will continue to experience in the future and, and focus in on that that is a state who took a, a look at its renewable possibilities and are exploiting those to the greatest extent. Southern Company is not opposed to commitment to renewable energy. Uh, all we would call for is to allow the different regions and, and the individual states to look at the resources that are available, make their own determinations for how much they can do and what limitations they have, and, and not try to put a one-size-fits-all renewable strategy across the country. The federal government should, should have an opinion, should tell the states, we think this is something that we need to do, and, a turn, and then turn to the states and let the states assess their own situations and develop standards that make sense for them rather than having to worry about whether or not they fit into a group. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Sloan. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and I want to point out Texas is a conservative state, and I can assure you they do not like mandates. Yet they do listen to the public, and the public made it very clear that they support renewables and they believed everyone should do some renewables and that people that wanted to do more could do more. Um, Texas policy leaders listened to that. They responded and they passed proactive, well-conceived and highly effective rules. Um, I think it's encapsulated. Uh, I asked the, the chairman of the State Affairs Committee, as conservative Republican as you'll find in Texas, David Swinford, and he put it this way about a mandate. 
He said, sometimes if it's important enough, you just got to give it a little bit of a shove. <laughs> Ms. Floyd. Last night I listened to a former Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan and he said one of his key messages was, this country is headed for economic decline or we need to change technology. And the question is how quickly can we change technology? You know, things have changed in this country with resource depletion, energy security, global warming, and it makes traditional energy technologies untenable. And we have the opportunity to be, participate in one of the biggest economic development efforts, one of the biggest growth industries of this century. And I think a passage of a national renewable um, electricity standard will show our leadership and uh, will help us capture this growth opportunity. Thank you. And we thank each of you for your testimony today. You are really helping this whole um, debate that we are having here in Washington and, and we are having across the country and across the world. Um, uh, back at the dawn of the industrial age in the United States, uh, in my congressional district when it began, when the Cabots and the Lowells built their first uh, factory right on the Charles River uh, in Waltham in my district, uh, there were 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere. Uh, now we have moved to 380 parts per million, putting another blanket uh, over our atmosphere, warming up our planet even more. Uh, if we allow it to go to 450, 550 parts per million, adding a, a second blanket, a third blanket that uh, will continue to heat up this planet, then there are really catastrophic consequences. Um, I visited with the Speaker and the Select Committee uh, Greenland uh, over the Memorial Day break. Uh, Greenland is, has a thousand mile long uh, ice uh, cap on it. It is 300 miles wide and it is 10 Empire State Buildings high. So think of looking at the top of the Empire State Building and then looking up 10 more times. That is how high the block of ice on top of Iceland is. And on top of it now are forming these huge lakes that um, are getting larger and larger. And as the summer goes on, uh, they eddy, they burrow down uh, right to the bottom of the ice cap, and the water then flows to the bottom of the ice cap, uh, uh, creating these moulons that uh, then further um, liquefy, further lubricate the bottom of the ice cap, moving it ever more quickly towards the ocean. As the, as the ocean rises, of course, Florida will be one of the principal uh, victims. So will Cape Cod, the coast of Massachusetts. That is why Massachusetts sued in the case, Massachusetts versus EPA. They were contending that they should have the right to protect themselves uh, against this rising uh, uh, tide of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of climate change that was affecting our 200 miles of beaches. And the Supreme Court ruled in April 5 to 4 that Massachusetts was right and that the, it, we needed a national policy to deal with this issue, that Massachusetts alone could not deal with it, that we needed a plan that we were going to put together. And it called upon, the Supreme Court did, the EPA to make a ruling on CO2 and whether or not it is a pollutant, whether or not it is causing uh, this uh, heightened uh, climate change, this global warming. Now the EPA unbelievably still has not ruled on whether or not CO2 is causing global warming. Every other environmental minister in the world uh, talks to that country in those terms. Our environmental minister does not. No one knows the name of our environmental minister. That might be you know, the beginning of the problem that no one even knows he, his or her name. Um, but that is in and of itself indicative of the fact that no one state can deal with the problem that we need a national plan. And then with that national plan, we can talk to China, we can talk to India, we can talk to the rest of the world. No one intends on this being onerous. Uh, I think it is just a matter of technology. I think it is out there. We can allow the states to be flexible in using the technologies and the resources that they have in order to meet this renewable objective. But I think that we cannot compromise on the objective, which has to be that we begin to first stop and then reverse global warming. Uh, and this is one of the central ways to do it, to generate the electricity which we need. 
And in a lot of ways, that's what we're learning, that 100 years ago, Thomas Alva Edison finding ways of deploying electricity across our country and then across the world. What a gift, a gift that led to washing machines and televisions and computers and iPhones that ultimately resulted, however, in all of this additional fossil fuel generated electricity. So like many things, it's, there's a Dickensian quality to it. It's the best of technology and the worst of technology now at the same time. And the same thing is true for the automobile. What Henry Ford did in learning how to mass produce these vehicles, it was wonderful. It transformed our country and the rest of the world. But 100 years later, we can now see how much it pollutes. So moving to hybrid technologies, moving to cellulosic fuel uh, for our, our vehicles in the same way that we have to move increasingly to renewables for our electricity generation deals with the other side of these technologies. Uh, which is the consequence that it can have for the whole planet and as a result for everyone who lives on it. And that's all we're really talking about now, a technological addition uh, to uh, what was invented by these uh, great people long ago to the benefit of, uh, of our entire civilization. And we thank you for your contribution to this debate. And, um, And we yield to the gentleman from uh, California who has just walked in, Mr. McNerney, for uh, his round of questions. And I would ask the gentleman if he would then adjourn the hearing at that point, at the conclusion of his uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, had to, I had to run between uh, meetings, so I'm sorry I'm a little late. Uh, but I appreciate all your, uh, your inputs. It's been interesting and informative. I have to say that um, I'm glad to finally meet uh, Ms. Floyd. Uh, we've had several telephone conversations over the years as I was trying to raise venture money for uh, wind turbine projects. But um, <clears throat> let's see, my first question is for you, Ms. Floyd. Uh, how confident are you that the, the, the national renewable portfolio standards would increase the manufacturing base in this country for wind energy, for solar, for other forms of uh, new energy technology? Uh, I'm very confident. Um, it uh, sends a very strong market signal. Um, it's one that investors will respond to. And I, I, wanna, I want to um, further your point that this is broader than solar and wind. And um, while you were out voting, I, I made the point several times that $2.4 billion of venture capital last year didn't just go into solar and wind, but really a broad range of technologies that can make a difference here. And so I'm very confident that this would send a, uh, a, a strong signal to the investment community and uh, to manufacturers, and with, that we would see manufacturing coming back into this country uh, and business expansion happening here as a result. My light keeps going on and off. Oh, that's that is encouraging because we have seen so much flight uh, of certainly wind, solar, uh, fuel cells going overseas. And it, whatever we can do to encourage that flight back to this country I think would be beneficial. Uh, is there any other members that have a comment on that question? Looks like you are ready to go there, Mr. Sloan. Yes. And I would uh, also concur that an RES will really make the, the manufacturing market take off. Uh, wind is really at the leading edge of the renewables that are going to be used. And I think particularly for domestic manufacturing, the parts are so large and expensive to move around, they make a lot of sense to build near the markets. Already in the state of Texas, just with the announcements that we have had with making sure the transmission system is going to be there and, and the announcements from, from investors that want to build, there has been a big uptick and manufacturing plants want to come to Texas. Uh, uh, one is uh, DeWind with Tico Westinghouse. They just built a plant in Texas. There are several others I'm aware of that are in negotiation right now. And that's just the Texas market. When you talk about the whole country uh, with a long-term stable policy, that's what the manufacturers want to see, uh, is to know that there's a market there, and not just a market today and gone tomorrow, but a long-term steady market, and they will show up here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Foster, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. The, um, 
Uh, proof, I think, is in what's actually taken place already as a result of the passage of state renewable energy standards. And earlier, when you were out of the room, I, I listed a half dozen locations where uh, plants had located specifically as a result of the passage of state renewable energy standards uh, ranging from uh, Pennsylvania to uh, Minnesota and Iowa. Uh, in addition, uh, our studies have shown uh, that there are some 43,000 firms in the United States capable of manufacturing the various component parts that go into uh, the renewable energy industry, all of whom would be impacted by the passage of a national renewable energy standard. I think the reverse is important to note, though, too, what happens when you don't pass one. I was in Kansas recently meet, meeting with uh, state officials there responsible for that state's uh, renewable energy initiative, which is not being done as a mandate but simply uh, on a voluntary basis. And they express, expressed great frustration that the one thing they could not accomplish with a voluntary uh, goal uh, was the attraction of manufacturing to their state, that manufacturers simply are not interested in making the investment where there isn't some degree of market expectation that those products will be used. So passage of a national renewable energy standard, in my view, would be uh, critical to bringing the manufacturers from around the world who are already doing that work to locate their plants in the United States. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Uh, Mr. Hobson, um, you have mentioned that solar is a little too expensive to, to seem practical uh, in the southern states. Uh, there is some new technology that uh, it's this, I would describe it as broadband solar photovoltaic, uh, where they concentrate power on a small reactor that takes advantage of uh, ultraviolet, infrared and visible light. Do you think that would uh, increase the viability, in your opinion, of uh, solar in, in those areas? Um, I, I can't specifically answer the question, uh, Congressman, about that technology, but I think that if it is a technology that, number one, drives the cost of solar down to uh, fit more into the cost that consumers are paying in the southeast, that would be very positive. And if it is a technology that improves the reliability of solar so that we can depend on solar a much larger percentage of the time, I think clearly those are the two factors that would make a technology um, uh, more viable and, and more easily adaptable into the supply side of the grid. No, I, I, I understand everything you have said, but uh, to describe solar as not reliable I think is something that would be um, arguable. So uh, you might want to look into that. And uh, the reliability of solar equipment is very good now, uh, from well, my understanding. And, and, and let me be, be sure I'm clear. When I, when I said reliability in that, in that sense, what I mean is uh, the amount of time that the solar, um, that the resource is there to, pr to provide the energy. I'm not speaking about the reliability of the solar equipment itself. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, Mr. Reilly, yes, um, do you think the time of day um, credit requirements would help uh, significantly impact the solar, um, the uh, cost viability of solar production? I mean, in your testimony, you mentioned that uh, your so solar energy is available when the load is the highest, at peak load, uh, and there is no provision for time of day credit. Uh, would that be an, an advantage if there is some way to include that in federal, federal regulation? It certainly would, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, currently, the utilities, uh, when they consider generation, it's all about time of day, and and that's how the the uh, numbers that I gave are derived is from the uh, the, the the cost at that time of day. Uh, most states do have a time of day uh, provision or rate structures uh, for the utilities to to offer their customers. And it's very critical in any any type of regulation or legislation that the um, the that, that the rate be non-discriminatory, and that you would if you would otherwise qualify for time of day, that if you have photovoltaic generation, that you can also be on the time of day rate. And to give an example, in Northern California today, um, the time of day rates are are very high uh, on the peak period, and and the photovoltaics are. Are, are cost effective against those rates. And so you could follow a strategy uh, of, of, of generating during when it is worth the most to the utility 
and in using your load when it costs you the least, and it works very well. So that might be a, another avenue to look at, Mr. Hobson, about uh, the, the cost effectiveness of solar if you <coughs> can get the local utilities to pay for actual uh, peak load costs. Uh, well, it looks like I've run out of my time, and I want to uh, thank you for your patience and my uh, arriving late in answering questions. Uh, and uh, I want to agree with Mr. Foster that uh, this global warming uh, is an opportunity for this country. It is also a significant threat and a challenge. But if we take advantage of the opportunity, we can create new industries, we can revitalize our rural economies, uh, we can end our dependence on oil and a, and a whole host of things that would be advantageous, advantageous to our country. So I can encourage you to continue your good work. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.